Today, I want to talk about Enterprise VDI and exactly how LeoStream has been helping our customers for well over a decade now actually build enterprise grade VDI or any kind of hosted desktop solution. So before I do that, let me kind of talk about what are the key aspects of Enterprise VDI? What does it actually mean to build a solution like this? Well, instead of just kind of going through these nine points now, I have three more slides that are going to break them down individually, but I bolded the words because these are really some of the key concepts, you know, hybrid, optimized, highly available, scalable. Once you talk about building a solution for the enterprise, you need to think about global workforces and making sure that no matter what happens, if it's a business continuity or a disaster recovery event, your users always remain productive. So let's break these down a little bit more. The first three kind of group into what I call an enterprise infrastructure. You tend to have just more and different types of bits that make up your data center or your hosted environment. The key there, hybrid. What we've seen particularly over the last few years is that most people are moving towards a hybrid hosting environment. You already have resources on-prem. Maybe that's actually just workstations under people's desks. Perhaps that's racked workstations in the data center. Whatever it is, you have this hardware you want to continue to use and may always need to use, but you need to wrap a cloud environment into that same solution, whether that be with AWS, Azure, Global, Google Cloud Platform, whatever you want to use, you want to be able to build an infrastructure that includes all of these different resources. Then of course, particularly once you start talking about having a hybrid environment and wrapping cloud into your solution, you need to optimize the resource usage. You do not wanna have more capacity in the cloud than you ever need, and you don't wanna leave it running when it's not in use. So you need to think about how do I build a VDI solution that helps me optimize those resources so my IT team doesn't constantly have to monitor and turn machines off for people. The last thing then, as you're infrastructure starts to expand into different clouds or a hybrid type model. You need to think about how do users get access to the data? Where am I gonna put the data? And where, where is it in relation to where the user is and where their hosted resource is? What we always tell people is it's best to bring the users to the data, not the data to the users. And so here's where we'll start talking about integrating with display protocols. So you're bringing pixels to the users while the data stays with the application that's running wherever you happen to be hosting that particular environment. So those are enterprise infrastructure things to consider. The next group are really your corporate initiatives. How does this fit into how you run your business and want to ensure that your business runs smoothly and continuously? The first thing to think about there is planning for high, avail high availability. You need to make sure that you have redundant systems, not just on the applications the users need to get access to, but also on the systems that they're using to access those. So your display protocols, your gateways, your connection brokers. You need to architect the solution in a way that makes it highly available. And then also scalable, whether that's because you have a global workforce or because you're looking at having a remote workforce. If your users are going to wander anywhere, you need to think about how do I scale the system as people wander around and as my organization grows. And of course, all of that needs to be done in a way that meets your corporate security standards. So think about how do I build a zero trust model into my VDI environment. Maybe that's by leveraging my corporate identity provider, implementing some, sorts of, some sort of multi-factor authentication, or thinking about how you build access control rules into your VDI environment. The last group of points here is about your end user considerations. After you think about your infrastructure and you think about your corporate workflows, now you always most importantly need to make sure your end users are productive and happy. And the first thing about that is making sure to provide them with the required end user experience. This again speaks to the display protocol. Can you use a commodity display protocol like RDP because you have task workers? Or do you need for some of your workers a more performant display protocol? And then the other thing to consider about end users, we already touched on a little bit, is remote work. This could be because they're global. It could be because you are in fact going to move into a hybrid work environment where users are sometimes at home and sometimes in the office. You need to architect a VDI solution that makes their experience seamless no matter where they go. Because the end user never really cares. How do they connect to things or where are they connecting to? They just know they wanna sit down wherever they're at and get to the resource they need. 
The last thing to think about with end users, particularly if you're going to start sending users home, that we already have, is BYOD, the Bring Your Own Device Initiative. If you do not want your IT team to have to manage client devices, you can allow your staff, your employees, to use their own device. But then the key is you don't want to be managing software installed on those devices. So you want to look at leveraging clientless access. People log in using a web browser to get access to their hosted resources. And then the connection is actually streamed into the web browser itself. This way you don't have to install software. You don't have to manage that software. And, it, and you keep that client's, the user's client device off of your network. Everything's just through the browser. So let's start by looking, before we actually look at LeoStream, Let's look at a, an architecture diagram, just so I can show you kind of high level in, in my kind of bad artistic mode here, how you architect a hybrid cloud environment with LeoStream. So here, what I basically have is an on-premise, on-premises hosted hosting platform, which can be VMware, Red Hat, whatever you want to have. And there's some desktops running there. And then you have the cloud, whichever one you want to use, Amazon, Azure, Google Cloud Platform. And you have desktops in those two regions running LeoStream agents. And then the broker, typically we see people put the broker on-prem. Maybe it's also could also be in the cloud in a private network, but the key is to keep the broker off the internet and use the gateway, which is up here in the cloud, as the access point for remote users. So if you for users on the bottom right who are in the office, they can log in by directly connecting to the LeoStream connection broker, which handles the authentication and then connects the user directly to their on-prem machine. But in this case, what we have for remote workers at the top there, they hit the gateway, which then redirects them to the broker. The broker still handles the authentication, but then assigns the user out to a machine in the cloud. And so now what we're doing here is changing what the user has access to based on where they log into. The access point is slowly, slightly different, so you can support these remote workers. And then for data accessibility, what we see a lot of people do is establish some sort of VPN connection using the tools that are provided by the cloud providers so that you can hook up a private cloud in AWS, for example, and actually have the desktops there access data that's in your data center. You might also put the data up in the cloud. That's completely up to you. This is just one kind of example here. So to start kind of looking through this a little bit more, let me share my screen. So here I have the login screen for the LeoStream Connection Broker. I'm gonna log in here as the main administrator. And I want you to notice a few things. First of all, let me go into the setup section here. In setup, this is where I hook the LeoStream environment up to all my external systems that I want to manage as part of my enterprise VDI environment. I'm gonna skip around a little bit. And first I'm gonna talk about gateways. In the case of my broker, because I'm looking at that hybrid model, I have two gateways here. I have one that's actually on premises with my connection broker. That's this one on the top here. Why might I want an on premises connection or LeoStream gateway when my users are already on premise premises? Well, the idea there is the gateway has that HTML5 viewer. So even if I don't need to tunnel the user's network connection to connect to a machine in my data center, I might want them to leverage the HTML5 viewer. So in that case, that's what the gateway is being used for. Then there's a second gateway here, which is actually running up in AWS. And this gateway is used to tunnel the user's connections into the private network that the desktops live in. So if you look here, just quickly, these are the two machines that I'll be using in AWS. So there's the gateway that's running. It's registered with the connection broker that's on-prem. And I happen to have one desktop that I'm just going to use for RDP. But you'll notice it has a private IP address, but no public address. There's no way for me to actually connect to this from my machine. So those are the two gateways. And the great, way, great thing about the way the LeoStream connection broker is architected is that these components, the gateway and the broker, are separate components. And so they function independently. That means you can have as many different gateways as in, in as many different regions and clouds as you need, and as many different brokers as you need then to handle the load based on where your users are logging in from. So now let's look back at centers. 
centers, here's where you build that hybrid environment. In LeoStream, there's a center for almost anything you could want to integrate with. And what that means when we have a center, it means that LeoStream integrates with the native APIs provided by that hosting platform. So this allows us to have very tight integration with the platform and inventory what's in there, provision new machines, terminate them when users are done, power control them, do all of the things that are important for you to manage and optimize the capacity, particularly in clouds or virtualization environments. If you are looking at a hybrid environment that includes hardware, well, you have a couple options there. You can either, for Windows machines or other machines joined to your directory, you can create an Active Directory Center and we'll inventory the computer records out. Or you can install the LeoStream agent on absolutely any machine you want, Windows, Linux, Mac, that will inventory it with the connection broker and you can manage connections to that machine and do some simple power control through the LeoStream agent. So centers are really the key to building the hybrid part of Enterprise VDI. Now, if we want to start talking about, okay, optimize, how do I optimize how LeoStream is managing these connections? That's done here through the pools and the plans and the policies that LeoStream provides. For pools, there's a few ways that pools help you optimize usage as well as capacity. For usage, we'll kind of talk about that more when we look at policies, because policies will assign pools out to, to users. When it comes to capacity, really the power of pools there in, is in how it can do provisioning. So as an example, let's say I just want to create a pool with a name that begins with, um, I'll just say edit devices here, edit. So any machine that is in my AWS center that has a name that begins with edit, I want to be in this pool. Now you saw I only have those two machines in AWS. There are no machines in this edit pool, but I can pre-populate it by coming down here and using the provisioning options. So if I enable provisioning in the pool, I can actually come up here and populate some number of desktops. If I just need to spin up a lot based on some AMI that I've already created or some image in whatever platform I'm creating in. Or I can even do this by time of day. So maybe nominally, well, it's the cloud. I don't want anything running. But on a particular day, I actually want to make sure that there are some number of machines running. You know, pick, pick whatever time frame works for you. So the pooling options for provisioning give you a way to make sure that you only have the capacity in the cloud at the time when users will actually need the capacity in the cloud. And then the parameters down here these allow you to tell us where are we provisioning, which cloud, which virtualization platform, and then depending on which you pick, it's going to just prompt you for the parameters that are needed to define how we're provisioning that machine. What image, for example, instance type, if you're talking about the cloud environments, networks, things like that. You can, in LeoStream, model persistent and non-persistent desktops as well as just about everything in between. If you do want a non-persistent workflow, there's an option here to set machines as deletable. So that way we'll create the machine and based on when you tell us LeoStream is allowed to delete the machine, we will automatically terminate it either in the cloud or in the virtualization environment or in the hyperconverged infrastructure if you're using one of those. So pools control provisioning to help with capacity. Pools also allow you to share resources among users. So if I offer users a machine from a pool, that means if I have five machines running Avid, for example, I can actually share that those machines between 10 or 15 users, however many you have, and LeoStream will manage making sure that the user is connected to an available machine, making sure that once all machines are used, maybe you want us to fail over to a different pool or you just want us to let that user know, hey, come back later, everything's in use. So really, that's the key also for the shared access is these pools. Protocol plans then will tell LeoStream, how am I going to connect? This goes to the end user experience that we talked about in our, in our slides. Because the display protocol really is going to determine the performance that the user has as they're looking at the machine and, for example, a video is playing or they're doing some sort of rendering. LeoStream does support a wide number of display protocols. The whole idea here is you can mix, mix and match them and use whichever one happens to work best for the different types of users that you have or the different types of client devices they may have. For example, if you do have B BYOD devices, then you want to use one of the HTML5 viewers that we support. 
if you are actually sending zero clients home with people, you can leverage PC over IP and have people log into LeoStream using those zero clients. The key here is that you do have control over how users are connected here. The power control plans, this again is another optimization, particularly around your cloud costs, because what power control plans allow you to do is control the power state of the machine. Or maybe I should say automate the power state of the machine. So that, for example, if the user logs out, maybe you wait 30 minutes in case they need to log back in. You want that login to be quick. But after 30 minutes, go ahead and shut the machine down. So then when the user logs in next, it's offered to them stopped. They can restart it and they need to wait for it to power back on. But they see this all in the UI. They know what's going on. And you're not paying for the cloud co costs, most importantly. The release plans then control the length of the assignment and determine when LeoStream is allowed to delete any of the machines that you've decided should be non-persistent. So as an example, you notice the, all these forms, the power control and release, they were broken into these sections. In the world of LeoStream, everything is very event driven. As the user does different things, LeoStream allows the IT department to take different actions. So in this case, if the agent comes in with a disconnect notice, you know, the user just closes their RDP session, for example, well, the broker's not gonna instruct the agent to do anything. But if the user logs out of the remote operating system, the broker will wait 30 minutes and then release the machine to the pool. This means it's available for the next user to use. That release event actually will trigger the section down here. And if you want, if this is a non-persistent model, you can delete the machine then at the time the machine is released. All of this comes together, the pools and the plans in what LeoStream calls policies. So as an example, here I have a policy and the key for policies is it is defining which pools the user has access to and which of those plans get offered to or get assigned to the machine that the user gets offered from that particular pool. So if you read through here, what I'm saying is I'm going to offer one machine from my RDP desktops pool, but I'm actually going to restrict who gets who, who is a whoever is assigned to this policy, I'm going to restrict if they get assigned to this pool as well. And that you might want to do that because you have a high level policy for perhaps your developers, but then you have developers working on different projects. And so the pools are assigned based on project while the policy is assigned based on you know, the developer group, just as an example. I happen to be doing it based on the user attribute, but you can even do it based on time of day. So if it needs to be students, but it happens to be students only from nine to five on a Monday, you can restrict to that level of access as well. Okay, so really optimizing pools, release plans, the policies, those are really the keys. Getting those rules correct based on your enterprise's needs will help you optimize your resource usage. Now, if we want to talk a little bit about data accessibility, we said, well, bring the users to the data, not to the data to the users. A lot of that then depends on where is your data hosted? Where do I connect users? What do I connect users to? Typically based on where they're logging in from. And that's the concept of locations in LeoStream. A location, kind of similar to how a pool is a group of desktops, a location is simply a group of client devices and you determine what's in that location, what's important to you, or I should say where is important to you, so that you know where to change what the user has, is offered, what protocol they're using, for example. In my example, I just create a device type, which is everybody logging in from a web browser. And then I actually have a subset of those, which is everybody on our internal IP address. And that way I know, oh, these are my users who are on-prem. But there are a number of different client location or client attributes that I can use to define the location. The whole idea being, you know, if your user travels to the West Coast of the US, maybe you want to connect them up to the AWS region over on the West Coast, one of the US West regions. While if your office is located on the East Coast or perhaps in the EU, you want to connect them to one of those regions instead. You have this control because you have these locations here. So we talked about policies being groups of rules that assign desktops and associate plans with those desktops. Locations talking about groups of clients. But now we need to actually get these policies assigned to users based on the locations they're coming in from and that's done through these assignment tables. The assignment tables are 
associated with the different authentication servers that you've defined in LeoStream. So in my case, I have an AD, Active Directory server here. And the way this reads is basically based on who the user is. And by default, we're using the member of attribute. So in my example from before, people who are member of development. In my case, I have a couple other groups. But if they're a member of a particular group and coming from a particular location, that determines if they need to go through MFA. So that is, again, pointing to this, how do you secure systems? You can, in fact, enforce MFA based on where the user is logging in from. So if you have remote users, they have to go through the second factor. If they're on-prem, perhaps they don't have to. Or in my case here, what I'm saying is when an admin logs in, they need to go through a second factor. I want to lock down admin access to this interface. But for my on-prem users, they don't need MFA. So between the pools and the policies and locations and assignments, you really have all the controls you need to ensure that users have access to the right data and resources based on who they are, where they're coming in from, and even what time of day and day of the week it happens to be. So now I want to go back to my slide here for a moment and talk a little bit about high availability. So when you're talking about high availability, the LeoStream interface that I showed you before, that's the administrator web interface for, base for the LeoStream connection broker. And when you install the connection broker, it installs on Linux, and it has everything in it that you need to get up and running. It has its own database. It has the Apache server running the web browser or web interface there. But obviously, if you just have a single one, that becomes a single point of failure, and that's not particularly highly available. But what it's very easy to do in LeoStream is build what we call clusters. And that can be done both on the gateway as well as on the broker. So here, what you see in my diagram now is on-prem, I've created a cluster of three connection brokers, and I've attached them to an external database. That database can be Postgres, it can be Microsoft SQL Server. If you happen to be running the broker up in the cloud, it can be Azure SQL. The key is the database is the truth of your configuration and holds the work queue, which is really the brains of what's telling each broker in the cluster what to do when. Work queue is a flat list and the, all the brokers in the cluster can work off of it to ensure that your, in, your environment keeps running. If one of the brokers should go down, the hosting platform that it's on happens to go down, maybe it's on an ESX server and that loses network connectivity, the remaining brokers keep functioning and your users never know that anything happened. The great thing about the way the LeoStream connection brokers are detected as well is it, the broker itself, doesn't tunnel any of the user's connections. It is responsible for identifying the user, authenticating them, determining what they have access to, and ultimately connecting them, but it is not in the connection. The connection goes from the client device to the desktop. What that means is even if all your brokers go down, your user is still happily working away and they have no idea. So that gives you high availability from a, the connection broker standpoint. For the gateway, you simply add as many gateways as you need to handle the number of users you plan to tunnel into that cloud environment or, or on-prem environment. And then you add them all into the gateway page in the connection broker that I showed you. So that's high availability. Now, if you're talking about scalability, well, I showed you the centers page. It's very easy for you to add additional clouds, additional cloud regions, depending on where your global workforce is residing. You simply add the different clouds or regions or even edge device edge locations into the connection broker. And obviously you have some networking considerations to take into account because you want the LeoStream agents to be able to communicate with the connection broker. But even if you have some pretty stringent networking constraints, the LeoStream agent is not required. You can manage connections to devices without the LeoStream agent or the broker able to communicate with the agent. You just lose some of the flexibility. Obviously, the broker won't get the events from the agent, so you can take actions on them, but you still can manage that device within LeoStream. So let me go back to my screen. Hide, not stop. So we talked about high availability, scalability. We talked about securing the systems with MFA. If you do want to set up MFA providers, it's quite straightforward. We have native integration with Duo, uses the Duo APIs. This works with a web browser login, so you can actually have users enter their PIN or request a push. But with any system that supports the RADIUS protocol, the LeoStream Connection Broker can 
integrate with that for MFA simply by using radius. So I use this with Okta using the Okta radius agent. I've seen people do it with ping ID. We also do support SAML. So if you have, in my case, I happen to have Google set up as a SAML IDP for my LeoStream connection broker. This also works. I've seen it with Okta, with Azure AD. Pretty much any way that you need to authenticate users and the number of different factors you need to use and what those factors are, there are different ways to model it within LeoStream. And then how they work and which ones you ultimately can use typically depends on the client device the user is coming from. The web client is definitely the best way to have the most flexibility when it comes to authentication. And so on that note, let's kind of show you the web client in action. And this is great for the BYOD case. In this case, I'm going to log in as Mabel. She's offered this RDP machine, which is that machine that's up in AWS. So she logged in through the gateway. The gateway tunneled the login to the connection broker, which is on-prem. And now the connection actually is going through the other gateway. It's going to ultimately go through the gateway that's running in AWS. So these are completely decoupled, that login step versus the connection step. And I can see all of that happening here as an administrator over on the system log page. So I see Mabel logging in what machine she was offered when she requested a connection. You know, it could be offered, maybe she then went to lunch and came back and finally requested the connection. You get an idea for people's work habits from this as well. As soon as she requests the connection, she's assigned, and now I get the launching the connection there. So you see everything that's going on. So let's go ahead and log out here. Now, if you remember, my release plan was actually set to delay the release based on logout. So Mabel's still assigned to that machine, but let's say that you know that user is logged out or um, maybe you had a release plan that had a bigger delay and you just want to be able to manually release it. You can do that. I could just hit release and that actually will release the machine and perform any of those actions that were set to be performed on release, which in the case of this desktop means powering it down. So you see, I requested the manual release. The machine was unassigned and now the shutdown is being requested in AWS. So if I come in here and refresh, I'll see the machine it's now stopped or in this case stopping. So again, the key to enterprise VDI is really allowing you to use the infrastructure that you already have in place in the enterprise, in your enterprise, while allowing you to future proof for whatever technologies or workflows are coming next. Hopefully you got an idea of the flexibility that LeoStream provides to allow you to do this. If you do want to try it out, we offer a free trial. Simply contact us at sales at leostream.com. Thanks.